Good morning, everyone. Welcome to South Point. Welcome to church. Glad that you are joining us here today. And uh, this morning, we are going to be meeting outdoors, as you can tell. Um, I'm going to be wearing sunglasses for this entire message. And it's not because I think I'm cool and I should wear sunglasses, but it's because I have a swollen eye that looks like I'm an extra from a bad Rocky movie. And you don't want to look at that for this message. So we're going to take advantage of being outside together. Hope it doesn't bother you or distract you too much. But I think sunglasses is going to be better than looking at this eye. Trust me. Um, And as we start today, I want us to open up with a word of prayer. And then we're going to jump right into our new book that I'm very excited to uh, begin teaching. So let's pray this morning together. Lord God, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the life that you give us. I thank you for the opportunities that we have to know you in this life. And Lord, today as we dig into your scripture together, I pray that you would teach us great things. Lord, as as I even look ahead to this book that we're going to study, I just pray that throughout these next several weeks as we go through this book, that you would teach us so many things about yourself, that you would teach us about ourselves, and Lord, that through it, we would continue to grow and develop as a church, as families, as individuals, as we follow after you, as we hear your word, and as we do our best to apply it and obey it. So we thank you for this time, Lord, and ask that you would guide our study together. And this morning, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, that our hearts would be open to receive everything that you want to speak to us. So we give you this time, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, long, long ago, before YouTube and before the internet or even public playgrounds or toy stores, parents would use different ways to entertain their children. Even before children's books were available, people would write poems or songs to entertain their kids. And some of those remnants still survive in modern times. Songs like Row, Row, Row Your Boat or Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, Um, as well as things that were called nursery rhymes. Some of you may have grown up with a a book as a little kid called Mother Goose Nursery Rhymes, or a lot of these nursery rhymes you've heard just in culture and might not know where they come from, but they're from way back when. They were nursery rhymes or little poems for kids. And sometimes they'd be funny, sometimes they'd just... Uh, be a tongue twister uh, or rhyme really well. Other times they would uh, provide some sort of a moral. They had their, their different things and sometimes they were just nonsense. But somewhere in the late 1600s or early 1700s, the historians aren't real sure, a nursery rhyme called Simple Simon was created. And I'm going to read you the first little bit of Simple Simon if you've never heard it before. Here's what it says says, Simple Simon met a pieman going to the fair. Says Simple Simon to the pieman, let me taste your ware. Says the pieman to Simple Simon, show me first your penny. Says Simple Simon to the pieman, indeed, I have not any. And then that's actually the first verse that uh, many people know. This little boy Simon wants a piece of pie from a guy selling pies. And the pie man says, well, you got to show me your money first. He doesn't have any. And then it goes on to talk about how Simon wanted to try to catch a whale with a fishing pole. So he asked his mom for a bucket of water and begins to try to fish in a bucket. Um, the, the, The gist of the thing is that Simon is simple. And simple is another word for unintelligent, but it can also mean just plain or ordinary, simple. And today, You might say, why on earth? Where are we going with this? Well, today we are going to begin looking at the life of someone who we probably don't view as simple by any means. We don't view this person as unintelligent or ordinary in any way. It's the opposite of that. And especially if we are a little bit aware aware of who this person became historically and in the Bible. Because here's the thing, it's, it's difficult for us to think about someone's beginnings if we know who they later became. 
Uh, for example, if I say the name Michael Jordan to you, is the first thing that you think about a little kid growing up in North Carolina? Or do you view the NBA superstar that he became? Or if I was to say Abraham Lincoln, do you picture a, a struggling young lawyer from Kentucky? Or do you view the presidential profile on the penny or the statue of him at the Washington or the, uh, the Lincoln Memorial or the top hat, right? You, you picture who they are, who they become. And the simple beginnings are often the most important things for us to understand if we want to learn who that person was and how to apply the wisdom of their lives to our own. And this is the way it is with people in the Bible as well. The good part about Scripture, one of the many good parts about it, is there's a lot of stories that start at the simple beginnings of someone's life. And it follows them through to watch the transformation that happens in their lives. And the reason that's so important is because that's where we start with simple beginnings. And it just so happens that the simple man we're going to study for the next two weeks was also named Simon. Simple Simon. But he's better known as Peter. Open up in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. And that's where we're going to be studying over the next several weeks as we go through this letter of Peter the Apostle. And I also want to tell you, too, over these next several weeks, we're we're going to try to do something differently than we've done before. Um, This week, you you have access to a fill-in-the-blank sheet that's going to hopefully help you coordinate your notes and follow along with the message and see what's going on. There'll be a few little key points to to remember there, um, some fill in the blank spots, but also some space for you to kind of get down your personal thoughts. I think that'll be helpful for you as you study this and also um, when it comes time to life group and to discuss these things too. Maybe you'll have some some ideas from it. And so Um, I encourage you to do that. And I always encourage you to bring your Bible and follow along in your Bible as we go through these things together too. So let's begin here with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And we're not going to go very far. We're actually just going to read the first phrase of this today. Here's what it says. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's how it starts. And that's where we're going to stop. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, We're not going to go any further into this book until we form an understanding of who Peter was before he was Peter the Apostle. Or if you're raised um, with a Catholic background, you've heard probably about many different saints. And one of the top saints of all saints is Saint Peter. Same guy. The Apostle Peter. One of the twelve. One of the disciples. Peter. This is who we're talking about. This is who wrote this book. But what about before he was an apostle or a a saint known by that? As far as characters in the Bible are concerned, we learn more about Simon Peter than almost anyone else other than Jesus or maybe the apostle Paul. Peter pops up over and over and over in Scripture. We learn more about Peter's life than even King David or Moses. His name comes up 165 times in the Bible, and that's that's quite a bit. But before he was Peter the Apostle, as we start off here, he was simply Simon the Fisherman. Simon the Fisherman. Simon first encountered Jesus near his hometown in the region of Galilee. That's probably familiar to most of you if you've uh, read the New Testament or heard the gospel stories before. The region of Galilee is where Peter was from. The most significant landmark in Galilee is still there today. It is the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and it's eight miles wide and to give you a rough idea of what that is like it's really a lake it's uh it's called the sea of galilee but it's a lake 
is what it is. In fact, if you've uh, been out here to Otai Lake, the Otai Lake Reservoir, the Sea of Galilee, as far as shoreline miles are concerned, is not that much bigger even than Otai Lake. It's not, it's not huge. Um, it's much, much deeper than Otai Lake, um, but it has a very similar surrounding landscape as well, especially that northern part of Israel where the Sea of Galilee is located is very much uh, the terrain and the, the, the climate zone is very similar to what we have here in San Diego. Now, Simon and his brother Andrew were fishermen by trade, originally from the village of Bethsaida, which is on the north shore of that lake, the Sea of Galilee. And that was their job. Their job was to every morning get up and put out their boats or put out their nets and go into the Sea of Galilee and catch fish and bring fish back to sell in the markets um, or from the seashore there to all the people in the surrounding area. Galilee the region and its villages were never big cities. Um, there was never a, an important cultural center around Galilee. In fact, even today, Tiberias, which is the biggest town um, located on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, uh, even today, which it, it has probably the largest population it's ever had in history, and it's still only about 45,000 people, which is not that big. I mean, Chula Vista is 10 times the size of, of Tiberias, roughly. Fishing was probably, like I said, the family business. When Simon Peter was a fisherman, it's, he was a fisherman because all of his family had been fishermen. And that's what he had learned, and that's what he was part of. Just like it was for James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which you hear a lot about in Scripture. And so Peter grew up in that sort of an environment. A simple life in a beautiful location with a climate a lot like ours. Now, he wouldn't have traveled much in the ancient world. We have the opportunities in modern times to spend a lot of time traveling and going in different places. Maybe not in this past year. Um, but for him, probably his entire life, he would have been at this point relegated to that small little dot on the map. His life growing up probably just consisted of learning the ordinary life of his Jewish family and friends and how to fish. We have no record that he was particularly spiritual or that he was spiritually in tune. He was just a regular person. Now also for, for Peter, he wouldn't have had access to the, the elite rabbis, the teachers of Jerusalem. But he would have had some education being a Jewish boy, even though he was from a small little village. Um, within the Jewish populations, they would always make sure that they would educate their kids. And um, according to the Mishnah, which is the Jewish oral traditions from the time of Jesus, it gives us some insight into the life of a kid growing up. Um, and what they would look forward to at different um, key ages in their life. And I, I thought this was interesting, and I'm going to read it to you to give you an idea of what Peter probably, um, what his life kind of unfolded like. Here's what it says. It says, at five years old, one is fit for the study of Scripture. That's how they would start school. At five years old, they'd send them to school, kind of like roughly about the same age that we do, and they begin by learning the Scripture. That was part of what they would learn. They'd learn how to read and write through Scripture. At 10 years old, for the study of the Mishnah, the traditions, that's what I'm reading from actually right now. At 13, for the fulfilling of the commandments, because at 13, you were considered uh, moving into grown-up, uh, the grown-up age, and so you were responsible for your own actions at 13. At 15, for the Talmud, that's the other part of the Jewish laws. There were the traditions, oral traditions and the laws that together made up the, the Talmud. At 18, for the bride chamber, meaning at 18 you could get married. And in this culture, most of the time, it was always arranged marriages. 
So for many of these kids, as soon as they turned 18, whoever they were going to marry, which had already been lined up from their families, was going to happen right at 18. At 20, for pursuing a calling, that means like you'd start your career at 20. At 30, for authority, that means you could become a rabbi. You could be a teacher of other people. You would have learned enough, understood your, your, uh, your trade well enough that you could actually teach someone else. At 40, for discernment, that's when you could start figuring out life <laughs> at 40. At 50, for counsel, they figure, okay, at 50, you've lived long enough, you can actually tell other people how to live life. At 60, to be an elder. At 70, for gray hairs, I'm already beating them at that. At 80, for special strength. At 90, for bowed back. And at 100, a man is as one that has already died and passed away and ceased from the world. (laughs) That's how they viewed the life of a person. So what do we get from all this? Well, what we get is that Simon was just a regular guy in a regular village living a regular life. Simple, Simon. But then his life took an unexpected turn. We don't know exactly when or where Simon met Jesus for the first time. But it would alter the course of his life. There are a few events that we find in the Gospels that happen very close together to figure out when and where uh, he met Jesus. The first one yeah, that we're going to look at, and I'm just going to look at three of these, these um, pieces of Scripture in, in, each of the, uh, in three of the four Gospels. In John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, here's what it says. It says, The next day John, who is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God! And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And later in verse 40, it says, And one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. And listen to who it was. Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And look what happens here. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And you might think, wait, what a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Simon, Peter, Cephas. That's the third name? The guy's got three names? Well, Peter is Greek, and Peter just means rock. Cephas is Aramaic, which just means rock. Um, In our culture, a lot of people are bilingual with, with English and Spanish. Well, in this culture... Jesus and his disciples, most of them were trilingual at least. They would speak Hebrew, which was the book that the Bible was written in. They would speak Greek, which was the cultural area of the whole Roman Empire, that language. And then also they'd speak Aramaic, which was kind of the common language between everybody. So Simon was his given name, but Jesus says, I'm going to give you a nickname, and it's going to be Peter or Cephas. And that means rock. All right, so this was, that was one critical time that Jesus met Peter very early here. All right, then another one's found in Luke, Luke 4.38, and here's what it says. And he, Jesus, arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Here comes Simon again. Now look, listen to this, because this gives us a little more biographical information about Simon. It says, now Simon's mother-in-law, which means Simon had to be married That's how you get a (laughs) mother-in-law. Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. So first, Peter, well, at some point, he gets a nickname from Jesus. Next, he witnesses Jesus heal someone who's very close to him, who he loves and cares for, as we all do of our wonderful mother-in-laws. And then we're going to see another thing happen here in Matthew 4. Matthew 4, 18, it says, And while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus again here, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, the guy we're talking about, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, I think for a lot of us, when we've heard that growing up or when we've read it ourselves, if you just read that on its own, you think that's how it worked. That Peter had never bumped into Jesus or heard about Jesus. He's just out there binding his own business, fishing in the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus walks up and there's some spiritual electric, electricity that blows off of Jesus and he just says, follow me. And everybody just drops their things and goes. <laughs> More likely... Peter had known who Jesus was. It had some of these other experiences with Jesus. And now what's happening here is Jesus is actually calling him to now begin following me as a teacher. All right. Now, the request to follow was more than just an informal, hey, guys, let's ditch work for the day and, and go hang out. That wasn't it. Jesus was inviting them to enter into a rabbi disciple relationship, a teacher and a pupil. He was asking, and based on what we just learned from the Mishnah, that thing that talked about this, the stages of life, we can guess then that Peter was at least 18, because remember, they'd get married at 18 minimum. And, and, and also, he was probably at least 20, because it seems like he's already pursuing the family business but he's still probably younger than Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Jesus started as a rabbi, began his ministry at age 30. Which, by the way, you just learned that that is Jesus following the cultural traditions of the Jews. You couldn't become a, thir a, a, a rabbi until 30. That's when the, the, the age for authority began. And that's when Jesus began taking disciples. Now, I bet most of you haven't pictured the 12 disciples as teenagers when they began following Jesus. But most of them probably were. Most of them were probably in their, their teens. We don't know um, for certain that any of the other disciples had been married before following Jesus. And it was very common for... Uh, a, a disciple to start following a rabbi before they were married, before they, they had a career. Um, like Peter, Matthew was probably in his 20s at that point when he began following Jesus because we know that he had a job as a tax collector. But other than that, most of the others were probably younger even than 18, which also might explain why Peter was the leader of the disciples from the very beginning because he was probably a little bit older than everybody else was. Now, let's, let's talk a little more about Peter and some qualities that we find in him. As we study the different stories from Peter's life, we also learn that he had some natural leadership qualities in his personality. It wasn't, probably, it wasn't only because he was toward the older end of the disciples, but, but he had some, some real leadership qualities. However, he also had some serious bouts with fear and worry. Okay, Peter would often be the first one to speak up. There's several times in Scripture where the disciples have a question about something and they're still a little shy to ask Jesus directly. So they say, hey, Peter, go ask Jesus about this. Go ask him about that. And Peter would be like, okay, I'll do it. I'll ask him. And Peter would be the one that would step up and, and ask the question. There's a, a story that's found in several of the Gospels. Luke 9 is one of the places where Jesus has his disciples together and says to them all, who is it that people say that I am? And some of them start piping in a little bit here and there. Well, you know, some say that you're a, a prophet. Others say you're just a great, you're a great teacher. Other people recognize you as a healer. Um, and then he says to them, well, who do you say that I am? And the one who s speaks up is Peter. And if you remember that story, what Peter says is, and what he says is a major, it's a major statement to make this statement. But Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And then later in that same story, we find Peter even being so bold as to actually rebuke Jesus. Once, once Jesus says, yes, you're right, I am. That's who I am. We're not telling anybody else about that yet. But I also need you to know that being the Messiah I am going to 
actually have to go and give my life and die. And Peter steps up and says, no, don't you talk like that. We're not gonna let that happen. All right, so Peter, Peter was willing to speak up when he needed to. Not only that, we also see that Peter was comfortable being on an equal footing with James and John, these other two brothers that we talked about. And yeah, they were his friends probably from the time they were little growing up together. They were fishermen also from the same area. Undoubtedly, they were good friends. Um, But remember what Jesus nicknamed James and John. He nicknamed them the Sons of Thunder. (laughs) And that was probably because of their temperament or their big personalities. But Peter could hang with the Sons of Thunder. But then we see the other side of, of Peter's personality too. There's also a story in, in the early, um, early parts of, of the gospel, or, or actually the later parts of the gospel, but before Acts that has happened, when the night that Jesus is arrested, when Peter cowers when a servant girl questions him and says, hey, were you with Jesus? Peter, this one who's been able to hang with the sons of thunder and ask the hard questions and do what he needs to do, when he gets pushed at that point, he's actually scared from the little servant girl. We also see other bursts of courage out of Peter. Peter is the one who walked on water. If you're familiar with that story from Matthew 14, all the disciples were there. They were all in the boat when Jesus came walking to them on the water, but it was only Peter that said, hey, Jesus, call me out there. I'll go out there with you. And he says, all right, do it. And Peter was brave enough to be the one to step out and walk on water. Peter also made some big promises to Jesus. When at the night of the last supper, when Jesus said, hey, all of you guys are gonna fall away from me. My disciples, the ones that have been following me for all these years, you're all going to fall away. What did Peter say? Peter stood up and said, no, I I don't know about all these other guys. They might fall away, but not me. I'll die with you. I'll die with you. And then when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden with Malchus, it was Peter who took a sword out and cut off the ear of the high priest servant, Malchus, in John 18. But then... That same chapter, that's when we find then that Jesus, as he's arrested and taken away, that Peter retreats and denies that he even knew Jesus. All right, well, what other things shaped Peter? Well, he had some incredible experiences with Jesus. And these are all important things. The reason we're going through all this, again, is we want to understand the person who writes the letter we're going to study. Peter, along with James and John, became the three disciples that Jesus had the closest relationship with. Of all the 12 disciples, of all the larger groups of people that Jesus interacted with while he was here on earth, Peter was the closest. Peter, James, and John. Those three were the ones that he invited to pray with them when he needed serious prayer. Those three were there when Jesus was transfigured And when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying in his hardest moment of life, praying that the Lord would take the cup from him, Peter was there. And not only did Peter walk on water, but he also had a front row seat to all of Jesus' miracles. And he even performed miracles himself after Jesus sent him out with the rest of the disciples. And Peter spent three years living life with Jesus, learning from him every day. Yet one of his most important experiences was also one of the hardest. And this is an important experience for us to know about when we learn about Peter. And it would shape him for the rest of his life. It would also shape the letters that he would write for believers that would become First and Second Peter. So the, the other section of scripture that we're going to look at here today is found in John chapter 21. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn over there, please do. In John chapter 21, starting in verse 15, we're going to learn about this event. Here's what it says. It says, When they had finished making breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, 
said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. You see, Peter had denied Jesus three times on the night that he was arrested. And here, Jesus gave him an opportunity to wipe those three denials away with three declarations of love. This was a moment where two close friends with all the history and the shared experience, they could meet face to face and heal the brokenness between them. It was also a moment between a human being and God Almighty. And in that interaction of grace and forgiveness, Jesus restored Peter and called him to go forward and continue the work that he had begun on earth. And isn't that like our story? What I'm really trying to get you to see here today is that our lives are very similar to even some of the great people in the Bible. The simple beginnings especially. Peter was a lot like many of us. He had some good traits and some personal strengths, but he also had some real weaknesses and failures. But I want you to understand that Peter wasn't chosen to be an apostle because of his raw talent or potential. It wasn't because of his deep spiritual sensitivities. Peter became a saint because he chose to accept Jesus' forgiveness and his invitation to follow him. Peter then aimed his life down that path. Were there still struggles and stumbles? Sure. But simple Simon was now a rock in the hand of his master. And when the Holy Spirit fills a simple life, anything can happen. That's important for us to know and hold on to. When God gets a hold of our lives, anything is possible. So as we finish here today, as we finish here this morning, the way I want you to think about this and the way I want you to respond to this as we begin to consider Peter's life. And next week, we're actually going to look at the the next section of Peter's life after he's been restored by Jesus and begin to look at what Jesus then does with the restored Peter when Jesus ascends into heaven and is gone, but then sends his Holy Spirit to empower Peter to do the work that he's got for him. And that's what we're going to look at next week before we get into the rest of 1 Peter. But where do you find yourself today? When you consider a life like Peter's, where do you see yourself? I told you at the beginning that Peter's life drastically changed once he met Jesus. Have you met Jesus? Have you responded to the call to follow him? If not, today is the day to do that very thing. And what if, if you have, if you have met him and you have begun following him, what's your current relationship with God like? We see that Peter had some up and down moments in his life. So, so much that on the same night that he swore allegiance to Jesus, It was the same night that he denied Jesus. Are you discouraged in your walk with the Lord right now and think that God can't or won't use you? You might say, oh, I'm too simple. I'm too ordinary of a person for God to even use me or work in my life. No, you're not. No one is. 
do you need a restoration of your own? Maybe you're, you feel distance from Jesus because of sin in your life, of areas where you keep stumbling. Maybe today's a day that you need to come to the Lord and allow him to restore you. I'm, personally, I'm, I'm glad that my failures aren't written down in a book <laughs> like Peter's are for the whole world to read and to study. But I do know that sometimes I hold on to a record of my own wrongs instead of letting the Lord restore me. Are you that way? If so, let Peter's story teach you that Jesus wants to cleanse you and wants to put you back on the right path. What's it tell us in uh, 1 John 1, 9? For if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to not only to cleanse us, but forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he does. That's what he is in the business of doing. By his grace and his goodness, he will forgive us and restore us. We don't have to worry about being extraordinary Christians in the world. We really don't. People that the the world can't take their eyes off of. Jesus is the extraordinary part of our relationship. (laughs) He's the one that does the incredible things. We are called to simply follow him and let him lead wherever he sees fit. And next week, we'll get to see where that path led for Peter. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the life of Peter. And Lord, I thank you for what you show us in your relationship to Peter. I thank you that we can learn that he was a simple man that you loved and that you drew near to and that you developed and you discipled and you cared for. Because we recognize, Lord, that we, are, we also are simple people. And it reminds us that you want to be near to us as well. I'm grateful for even some of the embarrassing exposure that Peter had to endure for our sake. I'm glad that his failures are recorded in the Bible for us because it reminds me that that even when I fail and when I slip up, you're a God of love and restoration and forgiveness that will pick us up and heal us and point us on the right path. Lord, as we go through this study through 1 Peter, I pray that you would give us boldness to follow hard after you that we would be people whose lives are truly transformed like Simon was transformed into Peter and that we would be people that pursue you and know you and walk all of the days of our lives with you. We thank you for this word today and pray God that it would go deep into our hearts and our minds and prepare us to continue to study and continue to grow and be the people that you're calling us to be. We love you and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week. Look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue through uh, the book of 1 Peter. God bless you. And now enjoy some time of worship together.